you. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Guy Magellanis, and I'm introducing Clark Mitchell. And um, what I love uh, reading on in his bio, besides him being a master pastelist, is that he was gifted as a small child from his dad a fine set of pastels. Mm -hmm. And he he just has gone on from there since childhood. Wow. So with if you have anything else you'd like to say or talk about the pastels and all that, I'll just step out of the way. Thank you. Well, I, I want to thank you all for being here both via Zoom and in person. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, I want to thank Guy for opening up his studio to us and so that uh, we can avoid the that calamity is. and the <laughs> and um, the meeting or the, the show goes on. So thank you very much, Guy. My demo is going to be um, pastels, soft pastels, not oil pastels. And there is a big difference between the two. I'll talk about specifically um, uh, details about the medium itself, uh, papers that I use, mm -hmm. and some of the brands of pastels that I use. Um, and I wanted to say I'm going to be doing a demo of a um, partly water scene, partly fall color scene, um, stormy clouds, so a little of everything. And it's a, it's a Petaluma scene. From, mm -hmm. I, I live north of Petaluma in Katahdin. So uh, lots of beautiful places in Sonoma County, and I know down here, all sorts of beautiful places to be. And uh, when I go out on location, I always use pastels. When I work in the studio, I work in both oils and pastels. Mm -hmm. So I'll do larger, larger pastel paintings from small paintings that I've done on location, and then go really big with the oils. I used to do really big old pastels, and finally thought, this is crazy. I'm having to. Uh, put them under glass or plexiglass and they get so heavy and mm -hmm. the reflections and we all know about mm -hmm. that. So <clears throat> uh, pastels are pure pigment in stick form. So um, <clears throat> lots of people, if they're not all that familiar with the medium, say, oh, you're using chalks. Mm -hmm. And chalk is white and is added to pure pigments to make a, a color paler. Um, some people come up and go, oh, you're painting in, in uh, charcoals. But no, charcoals are black. <laughs> um, but burnt burnt um, sticks or the wood, some kind of. <clears throat> so um, pastels come in all sorts of shapes typically stick form, although now there are pastels that even come in, in little um, dishes. They're, they're already ground and they're <clears throat> called pan pastels and you use a little applicator brush like a makeup applicator and do very soft pastels with those. Um, here are some of the, the sizes and shapes of the sticks that I use. Mm -hmm. um, if, if it makes sense, I can get closer, but I'm not here to sell any particular brand. I don't use any one brand. I use lots of different brands. Some are softer, some are harder. Um, some are much larger sticks. Some are much um, skinnier. Mm -hmm. They're all called soft pastels, even though some brands, as I said, are harder and some are softer. <clears throat> and I work on sanded papers. Mm -hmm. So um, some sanded papers are white, some are a, a pale buff, and then wonderfully um, a variety of manufacturers come out with different colors so the paper is toned to start with so I don't have to tone the paper. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing about all of these is that they are sanded the ones that I use, they have grit to them. So they grab the dry pigment and hold on. I'll pass these around to the lucky people who are here in person. Yeah. <laughs> so they can feel. And, and some of the brands um, have six or eight different grits. So you can choose. Um, 
Most are archival, so they are acid free. The backing, because the sand, sanded coating um, is applied to, um, is uh, acid free, so it won't break down over time. <clears throat> when I was first starting to do pastel, there were very few papers and also very few brands. And that, that, I don't mean to sound like I, I, it was two centuries ago, it was only one century ago when I started to <laughs> do pastel. Um, with quite a difference in the papers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you can really choose how much um, grit you want. And there are some papers that do not are not sanded, that have some texture. Um, mm -hmm. If I want to do very quick studies, I sometimes will use um, cold press, um, oh. well, hot press paper. You can also use cold press watercolor paper. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are watercolors, they're, they're um, very pronounced hills and valleys. Right. So you can drag a pastel across that and, and it mm -hmm. will only hit the hilltops. Can and then the valleys the have a contrasting color. What, what was the Do question? you have a favorite of the papers that you use? Um, most of these are the ones I use regularly. Mm -hmm. I think there's three three brands in there mm -hmm. that I use. Um, UART is one that has eight different grits. Um, Canson, um, Canson Touch. Canson was one of the papers, initial pastel papers, but it, it did was not sanded, and they finally come out with a sanded mm -hmm. surface. And then um, Art Spectrum, those three are the, the ones that I use the most. And the sticks of pastels come from all over the world. Um, so Australia, um, England, um, Japan, um, definitely the States, all sorts of uh, brands here in the States. And um, every two years, there's an in international pastel convention in Albuquerque. And you go there and all the new companies have their brands out. So it just keeps expanding. It's very exciting uh, to have so many choices. Yeah. And feel free to ask questions. I'm sorry, the folks in Zoom, you know, I, I don't know if you have it set up that they can send in questions. That's yeah, beyond actually, my capability. That's yeah. why I'm so glad to have, come here and got yeah. guy uh, yeah. knew what he was doing. <laughs> so you work mostly with soft pastel? That... They're all soft pastel. Okay. That's but good. some brands are harder and some are softer, mm -hmm. but all dry pastels are soft pastels. Okay. And then oil pastels are like grease crayons. Mm -hmm. okay. um, they are very, very rich pigment. Um, that they're kind of sticky when you're working with them, and they take a lot about a year to dry completely. Wow. So do you paint with those very often? The, the oil? Never. Oil, okay. uh, no, never. I did as a kid, and I actually used them with turpentine, so it, it made it more like a paint. Oh, okay. But I don't want to confuse folks. Yeah, right. So you. when you said you, you did large oil, oil. you were talking oil about paint. painting. Yes, with brushes, yeah, not and, the oil pastel. Yes, and, oh, and to okay. confuse people even more, a lot of my oil paintings, um, I mean, I incorporate copper, aluminum, or um, gold leaf. Yeah. Ooh, just there, there are so many incredible oil painters that I kind of came up with. What's something a little different? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so so, so go to my website. Yeah, and and I'm sure that I'm, I'm assuming the newsletter said what my website was. So, so um, oh. Initially, when I took one class, um, there was uh, you put dark oil, not oil pastels, but those square ones. I guess they're soft, and then you put turpentine on them. Mm -hmm. I'll be using alcohol. Alcohol. And I don't. I do a value study. Okay. Or a value sketch underneath, but not all the same color, so not all grays. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a lot more colorful than that. Yeah. So the joke was, well, you can always put the vodka on it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I use rubbing alcohol, not vodka, <laughs> but I could. So here, some, some of the pastel papers are coming mounted already on acid free backing. Wow. Um, this paper um, was not mounted, but this shows you what I do when I go out on location. Mm -hmm. I have the pastel paper already taped to the board, and then I have glassine, mm -hmm. and, and my glassine is over mm -hmm. out of the way. Um, it's okay. It's slick paper. Mm -hmm. So I take slick paper down over this. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I typically take three different formats, square, so you, that's nine by 12, 12, 16, or long skinny. Um, 
So that's what you draw on. To get when I'm on location. Yeah. Okay. And then I have a choice of yeah. whatever format. Mm -hmm. Right. And I can I can choose vertical or horizontal. Mm -hmm. well, that's um, a good idea. And mm -hmm. how I figure out which I want to do is through sketches. Mm -hmm. So um, this is the uh, pencil sketch that I did for the demo that I'm going to be doing. These are very quick thumbnails. You know, I, I have find some of my students are meticulous with their thumbnails. And I think, <laughs> no, the light's changing. Get going. <laughs> Get to color. So um, as I said, I will try out different, possibly I don't have too many that show both, but I, I'll try out, say a thumbnail, a horizontal, mm -hmm. a vertical. Um, when I go out on a location, what I look for, first of all, is contrast. And I am not a tonalist. I don't typically do very subtle, foggy scenes or um, evening. I love to do them, but there are just so many scenes that have that dramatic light and dark and high, um, <clears throat> high value contrast. Yeah. But that's what my eye goes to first. And then, um, whether I'm working from a photo or mm -hmm. <clears throat> on location, I always have a view capture. There you go. Um, I used to have cardboard corners. Yeah. <laughs> I used to do this. Yeah. <laughs> and it finally occurred to me, this is not a rectangle. I can't make a rectangle out of my four fingers. <laughs> you know, it's something approximating <laughs> that. So when I found an artist came up with this view catcher, it was like, this is a lifesaver. And I use it for every painting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you close one eye and look through it. And you can kind of say, oh, I love that vertical composition. Or Oh, I want it to be a square. Square looks the most dramatic. And you can hold it closer or farther away and get more information, more of the scene. It's like zooming in with a camera, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I always start with this, figuring out what I want to paint. And then I go to um, doing thumbnails. And once I'm pretty satisfied with that, I will go to, say, the paper that I brought with me. On location. And it's pretty similar when I'm working in this studio. You can see that I have, I, uh, it's probably easy. okay. I put marks mm -hmm. around the sides at mm -hmm. halves and thirds. Mm -hmm. That way, when I'm transposing from this little guy mm -hmm. to a larger format, once again, halves, mm -hmm. thirds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. This line comes in right at mm -hmm. a third. Yeah. And it's so easy to go from my little sketch yeah. to my mm -hmm. larger piece of paper and then to the even larger. And everything's still in the same place. Mm -hmm. The one thing is you have to have the same proportions from your sketch to whatever you're mm -hmm. working on. A lot of people, a lot of students I see will try and squeeze <laughs> a paint a, a sketch that they love into or, or uh, their photo reference into a different format. It's not going to work ever. <laughs> you just can't make it. Let me, um, as I said earlier, if you have any questions, please ask because I get on a roll and I, I can forget some of the, the initial mm -hmm. steps. Mm -hmm. um, I use pastel pencils. So it's the very same pigment in pencil form to do my um, sketch onto the sanded pastel paper. So I did that here. You can see uh, um, they're visible. I'm not gonna take it off the, the easel right now, but there's still some reddish tones, hints of the color that I was using. And I typically will use a red or an orange, something that will really stand out on the pastel paper I'm using. Now, that's not going to work on this paper because it's already this brick, this rich brick color. You know, the whole sheet was toned that way by the manufacturer. Um, well, so, you decide which background you're going to use. Yeah, which. Background. Well, if I'm going to do a cold spring scene with all greens and, and blues and yellows, I would probably use a warm paper to warm things up. Um, if I'm going to do a nocturne, I might want to use. Uh, uh, purples, something like that. I'm trying to think if it's obvious here. 
this one was probably the same. Uh, it is a go anyway, pale yellow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was fairly pale scene. I didn't want it to get too um, too intense. I wanted to keep it subtle, springtime mm -hmm. colors. But I could have done, you know, typically if it's going to be a, a, a cool painting, I'll use warmer colors. I think I used a, a much warmer um, mm -hmm. toned paper for this because already it was going to be a very rich scene and, and predominantly warm colors. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted a warm mm -hmm. um, tone underneath. And Someone with uh, you were talking about when you took a workshop and your underpaintings were um, various shades of gray or black. Um, that's one of the reasons why I don't use um, charcoal to do my um, underpaintings because I want various rich tones showing through. And that's going to be the, the my next step will be my underpainting. I'm going to use one layer of pastel for each large. Mm -hmm. chunk of the, of the composition. And then I will start layering and, and I'll use alcohol to set that one color. And I clean my brush in between each step. You can use pastel is an interesting medium in that uh, these dry pastels, soft pastels are soluble in alcohol, turpentine or turp, um, unscented turpentine products mm -hmm. or water, all three. And most mediums are soluble in one or the other. You know, now we're getting hybrids like the water soluble oils and, and uh, slow drying acrylics. You know, you know, everything, things are being stretched, the limits of things, but um, typically things are only soluble in one or the other, oil based or water based, but pastels are soluble in, in all three. Mm -hmm. I use alcohol, especially in my painting on location because it dries so fast. Mm -hmm. There's nothing worse than watching the light change and waiting for my underpainting to dry. And I pretty much do underpaintings for all my uh, scenes. Um, occasionally, if I'm painting at the coast and it's a foggy overcast day, and I just know it's going to take 45 minutes for that to dry, then I won't. Because um, you want your underpainting to be bone dry or else what it does is melt the stick of pastel mm. and you get too much pigment on the paper. Um, somebody was asking how, how I choose what tone. Also, how do I choose which paper? Some, as I said, are rougher than others. So if you're using a very rough paper, it's going to really grab the pigment and more will end up on the paper than I might want. Um, so I typically go for a middle of the road grit. Um, so that I have that option. But one, um, one, of the, one of the wonderful things about the sanded papers is they allow you to do layer upon layer upon layer. Um, some of the early pastel papers I was using had very little tooth to them. And you couldn't do more than one or two layers of color, even if you blend it. Mm -hmm. And that's what you were asking about. You know, is it okay to blend? Um, I do a lot of blending. You'll see. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'll get far enough into this to uh, to do some blending. But maybe. So how do I choose what colors? I um, carefully would be good to show this close. This is a photo. I did not do this painting, the pastel on location. I, I um, whenever possible, I have a camera with me. So I was out in Petaluma uh, the day after a, a big one of our recent storms, mm -hmm. and the clouds were still hanging around, and they were spectacular. And so I took probably a hundred photos. I, I just love digital photos because you don't run out of film and have to get some more. Um, so. As I said, I look for contrast. This one had some nice contrast up in the clouds, high contrast, the oak trees, um, kind of a nice um, pattern on the hillsides, some shadow in the background, high bright sunshine on the grassy plain in between. Um, definitely the swan stands out because it's white, the sun's hitting it. Um, I 
Often, if I'm going to do a large painting, especially if I'm going from a small pastel to a large oil or, or photo reference, I will do an intermediate stage. I'll do a quick pastel just to make sure. Is it going to be worth it to blow this up to a 30 by 40, 40, 60, whatever um, oil painting? And I really can't decide that just by looking at the photo. Once in a while, I see a photo. It's like, oh, I know right away that's going to translate beautifully. I, I'll play around with the composition in my sketches and then go right for it. But often I will do what I've done here and do a smaller pastel. I also thought it would be easier for you all to understand where I am going to have a pretty much finished painting. Show that. Mm -hmm. oh, good. Okay. Gorgeous. So I, I work out a lot of the bugs at this stage. And I'm going to make some changes from this as well. And I will point out a couple things from the photo. Right away. There's an unbroken line going all the way across the picture plane. Now, I, I since I was you know a, a student years ago, and I still consider myself a student. I still take workshops. Yeah, um, there there was an unbroken line all the way across, which you know hopefully your first painting teacher said, you know that's going to make it two paintings rather than. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a continuous composition that flows comfortably throughout the scene. So I made sure that this, though, with the reeds, I don't think they're cattails, but something akin to cattails, went up over that line. Um, I felt that the eucalyptus trees were a little bit too centered. So I moved them over to the left. Now you'll see in, in the painting I'm going to do, I move them back over. I, I had a different idea once mm -hmm. I saw this. Mm -hmm. um, what else did I change? Definitely the sky. I mean, this is this is an interesting sky, but it was such a dramatic day with the clouds pulling apart and the rich blue sky coming through. And that isn't apparent in the photos. So I kind of figure it's my job to enhance what I'm working from whether I'm on location working straight or if I'm working from a photo, you know, what's going to make this a stronger painting? Yeah. Well, you know, how can I own this as my own scene rather than um, how, you know, I spent years testing myself. Can I recreate what I see in front of me? And now, you know, I, I figure I finally graduated. <laughs> I can make them a little bit more my own. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I loved, you know, I was, uh, took two trips to New Mexico this, mm -hmm. this uh, earlier this year, road trips to two different conventions. And if there's anything New Mexico is famous for, it's the spectacular clouds and skies. And I just fell in love. And, and we don't get days with incredible clouds and sky popping through all that off. So when I had the opportunity, it's like, okay. Um, that's the photo I'm going to do, and that's what I chose to do for uh, my demo here. Uh, let's see if there was anything else. Oh, I, I brought in the photo the, sh the shadow on the hillside, cloud shadow, doesn't go all the way across. And I thought, well, that's kind of nice. This would be, it would help pop the uh, eucalyptus grow forward some. Um, I shrunk the eucalyptus a little bit. Uh, I was thinking of making the, uh, the hilltop even higher, mm -hmm. but then that's kind of towering over what's down below. You take some of the attention away. Uh, let's see. Oh, the swan also is kind of close to the middle. Mm -hmm. So I pulled it farther over to the left. So as I progress, I'm going to be working from both the photo reference and the pastel that I did. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, I feel much safer now. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me, but um, could you, I'm on Zoom. Could you tell us the tooth you're using in your paper? 
Uh, this is art spectrum, and it only comes in one, two. When I use, um, where did, did I? Oh, the paper samples. Yeah. I forget the names when I'm standing in front of a crowd. Um, when I use UART, I use 600. Um, most of the people I've talked to use 400 on the UART. It's a little um, rougher than what I'm using, but I prefer to use, you can, you can see on the back, they have grit markings mm -hmm. the same way as sandpaper in the hardware store does. Yes. So 600 is the grit that I prefer. And most of the other papers that I, or all the other papers that I use only come with one grit. And I'm glad to know that you can ask questions. <laughs> I was thinking, is that my phone? Is that <laughs> Siri <laughs> So generally, no matter what the paper is, you use 600? Uh, UART is the only one that gives you a choice. Oh, I see, okay. And so on that one, yes, I use 600. The other ones come with the one grit that they have. I think, as I said, things keep changing. So manufacturers are coming out with two and three different grits. Um, but UART's the one I use the most that, that gives you that choice. Thank you. Sure. So where to begin? Um, for me, the underpainting, the most important thing is the values are correct. So the light and the dark are represented in the underpainting. It's not so important to me that I have the right color. And so sometimes I'll, I'll go wild with my <laughs> underpaintings. When I'm working in the studio, when I'm on location, I'm, as I've said, I'm being forced to paint fast. You know, if I don't get my painting done in an hour and a half, maximum two hours, the light has changed so much, mm -hmm. unless it's a totally overcast day, that I really should start a new painting and come back the next day mm -hmm. or finish from photo references. Um, so I don't invent, I don't um, experiment as much on location. Uh, in the studio, I have a lot of fun. So that's more what you'll see today is a studio painting. Um, so as I said, I like to get the value correct. So for the highlights, I want to keep them nice and light and bright. Maybe not the color they're going to be in the finished painting, but nice and bright. Um, I'm going to do a little bit on the cloud right off the bat. And Pastels, you have a choice. They can be a drawing medium or a painting medium. By tipping the stick up, I can draw with a stick. Mm -hmm. And I can find, even with a big fat pastel like this, I can find a little edge and do a very delicate line. And I can alter my pressure. I consider that drawing. And some pastels draw or, or use line work from beginning to end in their work and come up with stunning paintings. I prefer more of a painterly approach where, so I use the side of the pastel. Once, once I've used the pastel pencils to do the initial drawing, I use the side of the pastel as much as possible and as far into the painting as possible. Mm -hmm. So I use the side of the stick and really cover broad areas. So you'll see that's what I'm doing, especially at this stage. Um, I um, way too early to be thinking about um, any kind of detail. I really save a lot of the detail work until uh, the last maybe quarter of a painting. I've been doing a lot of um, lavenders. Blue and, and pink lavenders up in up in the clouds lately. And as I said in New Mexico, I did um, the two two trips. I did 12, 12 plein air paintings because rather than go to the conventions <laughs> with crowds of people in the ballrooms picking up painting, whenever I could. One of the conventions I was um, for the plein air convention, I was a uh, field painter and was required to be on location mm. or in the ball, in, in the facility during the day. And I wanted something a little different. 
So I was always around when I was supposed to be, but the minute recess was called, I was out painting. <laughs> now you can see I'm not spending a lot of time um, covering everything because the liquid, whichever liquid you choose, is going to spread that pigment and cover. And I don't want a heavy, um, strong application of any color at this stage anyway. I want very subtle, thin application of pigment so that plenty of tooth remains and I can do as much layering on top of that as possible or as I want. Uh, pretty important now, I think, to get the patterning of the hills, of the trees on the hills. So I know what I'm working around. And this patterning isn't all that important that I'm getting it exact because I'll be changing it around. What I wanted to do is kind of lead the eye down through the hills and the valleys and then down towards, you know, where the real action is happening. This is the backdrop. So I don't spend a whole lot of time fussing with detail. Plus, I have a, a limited time today, so I don't want to um, take up too much time doing the finesse work. It really is. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you might not have heard. Um, someone said it's like a jigsaw puzzle, and that's what I consider it, yeah. because I'm only using one color per area. And there are all these puzzle pieces that are fitting into each other. Now, this is the hillside. Its value is very close to the uh, clouds, but it's a, a touch darker. What I'm using is a, uh, a pink. Um, I, I forget that people are interested in what colors I'm using, and it might not necessarily um, show up on the camera. So if I'm forgetting to say something like that, please uh, remind me. And then I have to decide, I didn't put in my sketch where, where I want the uh, shadows on the hillside to be. And again, that isn't so important. This is, this is all the backdrop to the, the excitement and the drama um, that's going to be happening up front. I definitely don't want the shadows to be uh, on the hillside to be at the same line as the top of the trees, because that uh, people try to read that as part of the trees. So I'm going to have a little higher here. This will be shadow. This will be shadow down here. And I can always change it later on. That's another reason why I don't want to add too heavy a application of pigment because especially um, really dark darks are hard to get off. Um, it's kind of like I know watercolors. There are certain colors, certain pigments that stain the paper. You know, this, this is similar to that in that. Um, some colors are hard to get off of the paper once they're on. Okay, here's a nice, it's not as dark as the trees, not as light as the clouds, and it's sort of a shadow color. Um, I like my colors to be harmonious. As I said, I'm not going for local color, meaning green for the green trees, golden or, or yellow for the, the yellow grasses. But I want the, uh, the nice rich colors and to be harmonious. So, so far, all of these work pretty darn nicely together. Now I have to decide. I was thinking rather than having the trees lit so that all three, all, everything from the foreground water all the way back to the top of the eucalyptus trees is lit. 
I was thinking, what would it be like if I put the eucalyptus trees in shadow as if there's another uh, cloud passing over? And I can always add even a little section of it where um, sunlight's hitting. But to start with, I'm going to do, so this is a dark um, maroon. You know, it's hard to tell sometimes on the camera. I can zoom. If people are interested, I can, I can get really close to the camera. Well, it certainly all makes it more interesting the closer in we are. Then I can, yeah, I can uh, definitely pull forward. Um, mm. I don't know if there's enough light in the room, in the studio, to, to really see it. Well, we can see it on your, your board. Okay. And right for the start, I'm going to go for some fall color. Mm -hmm. These two uh, were kind of little orphans sitting out here mm -hmm. off to the right of the barn. So what I've done, because in this sketch, the barn is right above the swan. Mm -hmm. And I thought the two were kind of competing for attention, mm -hmm. one right above the other. So I have moved the barn over to the right-hand side mm -hmm. and decided to clump these two I don't know what they are. It's not a poplar tree. I'm making them more like poplars here. Um, plump them together and be, have them right behind the barn. Mm -hmm. And the, the barns were pretty much white. I'm going to add, uh, put a little color to the roof. To differentiate that plane from the front plane of the building. I don't want anything over here to distract too much from the swan, what's down here. Um, so I'm just doing a hint of a rooftop, something like that. I'm using, this is a sort of a rose, a mauve color for the roof tops. So it's not to get, draw too much attention to it. So. Okay, so right here is also part of the wrong color. Ah, there it is. Part of the shadow, the with the street. Now it's going to come to life if it's not already. <laughs> when I start adding some of the hot colors up front, the hot yellow of this field. Now I could do a contrasting color underneath that, but I'm afraid it might tone it down a little too much. But what I'm going to do is let's see what this is like. So in this case, I am using the local color, the actual color of those grasses. And the tone of the paper, coming through is making a, is going to make a big difference to how each color appears. Um, in this case, I was using UR, so that was that very pale buff color. Um, so the tone of the paper wasn't doing a whole lot other than tying the scene together. I guess that's something I should mention. One of the reasons I like to use tone paper is because it does pull the painting together mm -hmm. right from the start. There's a unifying color everywhere and it just pops through here and there uh, but that's the reason i don't use white just because white constantly all these little bits of white are popping through um, and diluting the, the vibrance of the colors that i'm putting on top i guess i should put that little path in pretty quickly put a little path right here or i'll lose it Excuse me, Guy, is your studio still in San Carlos? Yes. Is there room there for another guest? Or are you full? Yes, I'm full. Okay. 
because I happen to live in San Carlos and I didn't realize I could come, but this is wonderful. Now, the, the reeds up front are going to be all kinds of colors. There's quite a bit of green in them. But right now, I want to use some. I'm going to use a, a fairly pale. It looks richer than it is. Um, orange. Because it's forward. I, I like to think in terms of warm colors visually coming forward, cool colors receding. It's actually quite interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe a little darker over on this side. What I liked on the, the intermediate step, the test pastel that I did, is that there was some shadow behind the swan. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to make sure I redo the swan. It was down a little lower. It was too close to the bottom of the, the paper. So I redrew it just a little while ago and, and uh, raised it up a little bit. <laughs> Linda, there is room if you want to come and, and see this in person. Is that possible? Because I live. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. What's your address? Oh. Uh. It's 620 Taylor Way. It's in the email that Carrie sent out. Somehow I missed that one and I only got this one. Okay. In San Carlos. Yes. I'm in unit two. Do you want me to bring a chair? No, just bring yourself. I tend to forget you do the color and the reflection mm -hmm. that's up above, mm -hmm. which isn't so bad. Um, <laughs> but I did remember all of the saying, I said, like, wait, I don't have any reflection color in there. Um, now, from what I was seeing in the original photo is that what's reflected down here where the reeds open up is the sky color. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna put some of those um, Sky colors in here now, sort of as placeholders. And when I redrew the swan, I didn't put any uh, shadow. Starting route to 620 Taylor Way. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and I think that the swan has probably gotten too big, but I can always shrink it as I'm painting it. Just bring some more of the outline, uh, the outline colors mm -hmm. over it. Okay, there's not much, there's a little bit down here that isn't covered. Otherwise, pretty much everything is covered. Now, you're welcome to take photos if you're interested. And this would be a good stage because it's going to change radically when I um, put alcohol on it. Ooh, it could hardly wait. Maybe I'll come out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome to get up close. Yeah, I'll take it when you guys are over there. <laughs> and I left out um, the blue at the sky. So, uh, you want to come right here, Yvonne? Okay. All right, you go close. And through here, I can show you what you can do with pastels. Right. If you're using a pastel paper that is toothy, there's one brand. Um, and I'm trying to think what it's called. It'll come to me. Um, the, the, it's a cork and vegetable fiber that um, is it's like a flocking that's, that's glued to the paper. And that is too delicate to use an eraser on. 
but most of these sanded papers are really very tough. So you can, if I want to erase something, say oh, I want to, it's like, oops, I forgot to put sky in here. What I'll do is first take a brush, a dry brush, and just clean all the loose pigment off. And then this is a magic rub eraser. All kinds of, there are all kinds of erasers that would work. I wouldn't use those kneaded, you know, those ones that you heat up by, by mm -hmm. wiggling, you know, squishing in your hands um, because they just get dirtier and dirty. But uh, magic rub, some of the other, this is, is kind of like a, a plastic or rubber eraser. But you can see, I'm pretty much down to the tone of the paper mm -hmm. right here. So, though I forgot to, and I can even do this part way through a painting. You know, if all of a sudden it's like, oh, that should be moved over there. I can take a dry brush, clean out the area, and then kind of recreate the background colors. So the, the powder just drops down. Yes. Oh. Now, I don't wear gloves and I don't wear a mask. Yeah. Um, some pastelists do wear one or both of those. Mm -hmm. Some have a little um like uh, opposite of a fan, a little vacuum right yeah. here, mm -hmm. so that anything that drops off mm -hmm. is is whisked away. Um you have that? I should have asked about putting down a uh, something on your carpet. That's okay. You could vacuum later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um I don't do either of those things. Yeah. I do wash my hands regularly. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know. I don't think I'm using cadmiums for right, these. Right, sure. They would have to warn you on the label. Mm -hmm. um, and I have somebody from the Library of Congress gave a lecture at one of the pastel conventions mm -hmm. about the toxicity of pastels. And his feeling was that the grains are so big that they fall straight down. Mm -hmm. So don't ever blow on your pastels mm -hmm. to get the excess off. Do something like this, oh, and then the, the the pigment just drops. Mm -hmm. um, I've kind of agreed with that. Yeah. You know, whether I'm not no scientist, so but it's easier to think that's true than. But so far, you haven't like coughed up pastel. No, <laughs> no. Okay. Oh, I'm going to add a few shadow trees along this ridge, mm -hmm. along that line. And oh, I didn't put the shadow in this one. Okay, so done. Woo awesome. It's been so fun doing a demo for you all. Oh, <laughs> We want the after effects of the alcohol. We want a little alcohol. Yeah. Party. Okay. Here's your margarita. The pattern the, the uh, first layer is done. I haven't worried about covering everything because, um, as I said, I'm using rubbing alcohol. Um, you can use, uh, I know somebody who uses denatured alcohol. And I'm thinking, I don't want one more toxic chemical around mm -hmm. in my studio, but. Um, you can use terpenoid. Um, I uh, use, um, oh, I can't think what it's called. Gamblin's product. Yeah. Gamsol. Gamsol, right. Or uh, water. Mm -hmm. And they will all dissolve the pigment. Now, one thing, the important thing to me is to um, clean the brush in between each color. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So I'm just doing one color at a time. Mm -hmm. Because I want, as I said, I'm wanting a pure, clean color. So there's no sense in going from one color to the next without cleaning my brush in between. And what it ends up looking when this is dry is, is very abstract. And to me, that's a lot of fun. And unfortunately, my natural bent is to go from there to semi-realism. If if um, lack of control drives you crazy, then you would want to do this flat so that there are no mm -hmm. drips. As you can see, I'm getting all kinds of drips. Yeah. 
And you know, I'm, I'm kind of on display here, so I'm. So do you usually have a lot of drips when you're working, or they do? Okay, and I think that's kind of exciting. There are accidents that happen um, that might lead me in a different direction. You know, as I was saying, the, the value is more important to me than the color too. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, sometimes I'll look at it and go, "Oh, that looks like a nocturne." Let me go in that direction because I'm not using the local color from my photo reference or from my painting that I did on location. Um, so I, I uh, make use of happy accidents. Really much darker than that. Oh, it gets extremely dark. And the, the tone of the paper shows through. It will go back dry. Um, this, you can see it's already drying up. Yeah. So it's that's shocking. why I use alcohol, because it dries so fast, evaporates off. Other than the drying time, is is there a reason to use one or the other? I mean, is there a different? Does it give it a different effect? Not really. Okay. I, I actually I shouldn't I shouldn't speak for water because I really never use water. Yeah, but terpenoid or yeah, um, not really. On a, there's a paper or two where the the um, alcohol will have a, a very odd effect. Mm -hmm. But not the papers that I use on a regular basis. Yeah, so yeah. You know, when we should do the building now. Oh, the brush is clean. <laughs> and I did, as I said, move the eucalyptus tree back over to the center, and I might regret that. But I extended it over to the right some. So hopefully that will be enough to um, balance things a little to that way, to the right. And I use, um, if I'm in a hurry in the studio, or if it's a really damp day, if it's raining outside, I'll use a hair dryer mm -hmm. to dry this quickly. Oh, I don't suppose okay. you have a hair dryer, do you? Oh, you do. Oh, of course, watercolors. <laughs> Here, I was trying to be smart, a smart ass. <laughs> <laughs> so once it has the alcohol on it, no, it doesn't. Hair dryer is okay. Yeah. Um, and all of those materials, water, alcohol, or the turpentine, um, set this, this one layer of color. So I can do contrasting colors on top, and they really won't mix much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but if I were to do just one dry layer of pastel and then another dry layer of pastel, they do mix. I mean, it's just the nature of using dry pigments. Mm -hmm. I now I understand this is this is in the archives, so th this will be on your website. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I do have to watch my language. <laughs> I suppose that would save some time to use the dryer. Oh, I thought you meant to not use a swear word. No. <laughs> Very interesting. It's going to take so long to do one sort of position.
but I tend to forget one little place when I'm doing demos and people go, why didn't you do that area? Like it's some important part of the process. Now, because I'm using sanded papers, mm -hmm. um, it destroys the brushes. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to use beautiful sable brushes or any kind of good brush. Um, I get closeouts at art supply stores or, or my old oil brushes tend to go, you know, if they're not too misshapen. And um, I, even though alcohol, I don't, as far as I know, doesn't you know, spontaneously combust. If you're using uh, terpenoid mm -hmm. or gamsol, definitely take your rags outside and let them evaporate. Um, in open air. Very interesting. How are we doing for time? Oh, no, only an hour. Okay. Actually, I will use the dryer. Okay. However, the only place that's still especially wet, the only section is down here. I think my old one is a Vidal Sassoon too. <laughs> Antique. Yeah, you can watch this dry. How light it gets again. <laughs> it's really surprising because it does go very back to the original color. Mm -hmm. Pretty close. Yeah, there's still just a few little patches here that are damp. Okay. Hmm. Um, any questions at this point? Mm -hmm. well, you're doing a great job at answering. Okay. Um, it's got a very nice plain line. You've got a very good distinction there between where it goes this way and where it goes this way. It's very, very good. Well, thank you. Yeah. You know, now I'm looking at it. I'm thinking I will probably have the highest point of the eucalyptus trees over here. Mm -hmm. um, again, to throw the balance off, it's it's a little that's a little too centered, even though we've got the swan over here. So now, where do I go? Yeah. Where do I start? What color do I start covering first? And as I said, I paint with pastel, so I use the side of the sticks. I would do. I rarely do any kind of um, tipping up of the pastels and using just that little edge. Mm -hmm. At this point, I want to do broad strokes and keep in mind my big shapes as far as possible into the painting. Um, it's so easy to get fussy if you start doing a lot of detail work this early or even halfway through. So where do I begin? Um, if I had a lacy tree out over the sky, I would have to do finish the sky before I could do the lacy tree on top. Because if I start working that tree out over the, uh, the, the sky, and then I want to work the sky in between, um, it just gets dirty and muddy. And a lot of people say, how do you keep your pastels clean? Well, one way, I'm always, you know, I always have a rag nearby. And when I pick up a stick, I will typically immediately clean it off. Because all of these are in the box. They say these are, are, you know, stay clean pastel boxes with foam on top and foam and sandwiches on top of this. Um, but still, each color is bumping into its neighbor and picking up that color. So I just automatically clean it off. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's um, one of the um, best ways to keep your paintings clean and your colors bright and vibrant. Um, if I have gone wild with the underpainting and they're colors that are really radically far away from what the finished color is going to be, that might be what I cover pretty early on because that's gonna throw off the color balance of everything else. So definitely the eucalyptus tree um, is going to go more, if it's in shadow, more blue green. If it's sunshine, it's going to be more, more of these olivey greens. Um, a lot of these colors are pretty close. This is too intense, 
There are going to be greens here, which right now are these, these um, pale orange colors. Um, the lavenders in the sky are going to go more towards gray, but that's not too far off. Um, so I want to bring some brilliance back to the clouds, and I might gear the rest of the painting, my value, to how bright I get the um, clouds. Mm -hmm. That and the barn, those two are sort of the lightest value of anything, and the swan. But the swan, um, I don't often put animals and people into my paintings. People typically, they'll, they'll be about this big, way off in the distance. <laughs> um, I tend to tighten up when I when I put animals in, just because I'm not as familiar with painting animals. So um, I'll probably leave this swan until fairly well into the painting. I'll do some sketchy work on it, but um, all that to say, I'm going to start in the clouds. And I always have to remind myself that clouds, even if I'm in New Mexico and I have a spectacular thunderheads that look hard edged, they're still just water vapor. Mm -hmm. So I have to remind myself this is soft focus. Mm -hmm. And the, I find the softer focus I use and the softer edges, the more realistic. Um, my skies and clouds look. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, uh, let's see, back up. Um, because this is almost raw too, by, by fixing one layer of color to the paper this way, it isn't the same as a dry layer that actually takes up much more space and takes up some of the tooth. Mm -hmm. So this is almost raw tooth. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to really grab the pigment. So I use maybe a, a brand that's a little harder pastel at this stage because that tooth is really wanting to grab the pigment. And I'm also pulling back on my pressure. Mm -hmm. Because with any one color, I can, I can do a very light pressure, medium pressure, or I can really press down and get three different values, mm. depending on how much I'm allowing to show through the background colors. Yeah, where was this? too pinky. No. Much harder edge, these hills than the, the clouds. And you'll find I jump all over the place. Um, I don't typically finish any one area early on. You know, I'll read a book like um, Richard Schmidt's A La Prima, and he's an exceptional painter, was an exceptional painter. Um, and would typically finish his focal point and then start working out mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and finish. And then at a certain point, decide he had enough information. He didn't have to finish from side to side and top to bottom. Mm -hmm. um, I paint very differently than that. And I jump around, I'll work this area, I'll work that area. You know, I always keep in mind what the focal point is. Okay, this might be a good time for me to. Um, decide where I'm going to have the top of the eucalyptus tree. Since I did say I was going to move it over. I was wondering when you're going to do that. <laughs> I want a little suspense, you know. <laughs> okay, so, and, and now, well, let's see. Sometimes dark colors are hard to cover over. No, this one. Yeah, I was able to match uh, cover over that pretty easily by pressing a little harder. I'll be adding more um, mm -hmm. oaks and bays on the hillside, but I'm getting the, the main scene uh, composition in. Well, you don't have to add more alcohol. Or, or I never use it as, again. 
just that for to set the underpainting, and that's all. Mm -hmm. Now I'm sticking in this composition. I tend to like think in terms of thirds. Mm -hmm. So does this? Yeah, pretty mm -hmm. nicely. Mm -hmm. And maybe this way thirds also. Um, often I'll have a focal point. You know, you saw that I had marks here and here. Those are thirds. So I like my focal point often. It's not going to be the case here to be at an intersection of thirds. So be, there would be four different places where you could have a com you know a typical comfortable focal point. Um, my swan, because it's a, a uh, an animal in a landscape, is is definitely going to be an attention grabber. I also have the barn. This is much closer to mm -hmm. um, the sweet spot there. The yeah, the sweet spot exactly. So maybe I'll play up the barn and play down the swan, if that's possible. <laughs> so as I said, maybe I would pretty soon. Now here, this is definitely more hard edged. Well, that's definitely going to get some attention there, mm -hmm. especially if I keep the uh, eucalyptus darker. So maybe I'll set the value of the eucalyptus now. This is a uh, dark blue. There are certain colors, blue grays that whole bind um, pastels, and you can only get them open stock if you order online, unfortunately, um, unless you have a really comprehensive art supply store down here. But I, I've kind of given up. You know, I buy from my local art supply stores everything I possibly can, and I don't mind spending extra because I want them to be around as long as possible. Yeah. But there's some things they just don't carry, so some things I do have to order online. And there's um, a company called DakotaPastels.com or Dakota Pastels that has anything you could want in the pastel medium from all brands of the sticks. Um, all the papers that are available, easels, all kinds of. Um, so maybe this is a good time to. Now there, I did tip the pastel up and use the edge to. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is going to become a great uh, focal point if I also do some highlights on these trees against the darker color of the eucalyptus. So I, I, I'm happier now <laughs> that, you know, this was a little confused. Yeah, you kind of looked here and here mm -hmm. and here. And I think this is getting more comfortably centered, not centered, but um, mm -hmm. localized on um, um, that part of the tree. Of that composition. Uh, let's get some little, some greens in there. I'm getting a little premature, but I didn't want to lose sight of where the um, focal point was going to be. Okay, now one thing I am not doing, and I don't even have with me, I had this well, painting on location once a lady pulled this out of her purse and said, you can have this. Uh -huh. In my studio, I have a hand mirror about this size, and I also have a full standing mirror. So I'm spending as much time or, or a lot of time turning around backwards or, and looking at my painting backwards and across the room. You know, the, I can't quite...
the really fat one. I rarely use this. What I use is my fingers more than anything else. Um, I was talking about pan pastels. They come with all sorts of blending tools. Uh, those were the pastels that are pigment in a little dish with a plastic top on it. And you can dip those applicators, you know, sponge applicators, and use that to blend. Um, packing you peanuts. Did you use that? The no. Pan okay. no. I, I have tried them before. No. Um, I find that the results, you know, because I do like the contrast between hard edge and soft edge. And it's hard to get a hard edge mm -hmm. when you're using sort of a sponge applicator like that, foam applicator. Um, packing peanuts, mm -hmm. you can use those to blend with. Um, the foam off of pipe insulation, mm -hmm. you know, keep your pipes from freezing in the winter. People use those. Um, I tend mostly to do this, <laughs> but you have to wait a while. You have to get a layer or two of pigment on there or else you're kind of filing down your fingertips. Yeah, no more fingerprints. Right. Now, what keeps jumping out is how dark this is. So pretty soon, I want to do a little more in the sky. Pretty soon, I want to get some darks up here in front or else this is just way too intense, way too dark. Um, I like the color contrast mm -hmm. of that, the uh, maroon showing through the... the uh, blue gray but um the value is too dark and i might not commit myself too much with the sky because as i was saying early on um I'll, I want to keep it pretty fluid, not knowing how it will affect the composition. You know, I want, I definitely want this, I like this um, sort of wedge in the mm -hmm. sky, fatter, getting narrower, pushing the eye down this way. Um, so I want to keep that, but otherwise, the rest of the patterning isn't so uh, crucial that I'm going to spend a lot of time on it yet. But it's already helping. These hills are coming alive a little bit more by knocking down some of the, the rose and lavender tones up in the sky. Oh, that's it. I couldn't even tell you what this color is. It, <laughs> you know, it, it's a, a purplish mauve. There's probably a little brown in it. It's a, it's a nice neutral. Well, that was my question: was how do you know what to reorder <laughs> when you run out of? Well, them? yeah. Most of the brands, some of the brands don't even do this, but most of them have a number. Mm -hmm. You know what the brand is, and they'll have a number. So this is the part you keep in your drawer. You uh -huh. never use the last little part so that you know when you get down, when you've used all of this, you know, oh, okay, it's it's Rembrandt 235.9. Okay. Um, now, some of them don't have any marking and they come with a, anyway, I don't have to go into that. <laughs> But I thought you were using the side, so I wouldn't have thought you'd keep all the wrapping on. No, no. On that one little piece I leave in the drawer, mm -hmm. I don't work with that so that wrapping. I can identify the color. The that color I, that and, was, yeah, mm -hmm. the side, and I've, I've worn it down to the nub. Yeah. yeah. My students laugh when they see my pastel box. Because, <laughs> I mean, because look, look at this little chunk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I do my best not to go quite that small, but you know, even something like this yeah. is, is pretty small. Oh, now I put that down. <laughs> what, what color Sorry. was it? No, that's that's okay. Because that means okay. So you can see right here, there's a lot of the um tone of the paper still showing through. Mm -hmm. Little speckles of it. That's why I don't use white, because that would be that would be white and showing through. Um, this is the point where I can start doing some blending. And I definitely, these three fingers are tougher 
<laughs> you know, because I do Latin yeah, so yeah. much. Such a, but it's such a striking effect. Good. You must have to clean your finger constantly or you'd be always contaminating what you're trying to work on. Well, that's what I always have a rag on my shoulder or a dish towel. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. And when I pick up the sticks, that's the first thing I do mm -hmm. is clean them off. Mm -hmm. uh, because, yeah, um, I'd be uh, smearing and, and, and uh, messing up colors. Okay, now I do want, before I get much farther, now I'm going to use the most intense blue up here, the farthest away from the horizon, and use paler, lighter blues, cooler blues too. I probably, you know, I could go all the way down to that. Ooh. I think that's probably too cool, but I'll leave it there for now, mm -hmm. just in case. Um, I want to warm this up, color on the hillside because it's it's uh, fighting a little bit with the, the color of the um, sky and clouds. One of the steps that I have to, as I'm checking later on in the painting to see if it's nearing completion, is how much of the, the tone of the paper is showing through, mm -hmm. how much there's just too much um, texture up here. And I want the texture and the detail work to be up here in the front of the scene, not way up in the sky in the background. So how do you get rid of it? You add more pastel to make it smooth? A blend. blend. Okay. Often. Mm -hmm. And and you can alter how much pressure you use when you're blending. So I can just very softly blend, okay. and that'll mix some colors without filling the the tooth underneath. Um, or I can I can be a little more aggressive the way I've been up here. Mm -hmm. You know, there. I mean that that might work now. Um, okay. When I was talking about a mirror, I also stand back a lot. And I haven't, you know, I get in the show off mood <laughs> and I forget uh, it's very important to stand back. And we're all telling you it's beautiful as it is. So. Right. <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> what I've done is uh, raise the shadow on this side a little bit more. But what the trouble with you know, I have, this is the set that I take out with me. Mm -hmm. And then um, mm -hmm. in the studio where I did this, I have supposedly all the same colors, but that's never the case because mm -hmm. I'll you know, fill up one box and not the other. So what I'm looking for is the color, this, this a little more um, wheat color, and I'm not finding it right off the bat. So what you can do with pastels, is um, you can blend two colors. I mean, it isn't like I can carry every color I'm going to use out with me. You know, I can, you know, if I've got plenty of tooth still, I can uh, blend one color and another using the tooth of the paper to grab a little bit of this color, a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. um, but once again, I prefer not to. So that's what I'm doing right here is I'm taking a, a much richer um, buff color over the whitish. I might leave it a little paler up here because that's the farthest away from the viewer. And it's also where the hills start turning towards the sky rather than um, facing the viewer. So the color would probably be a little paler. It's getting reflection from the sky, from the clouds. Mm 
And sometimes after these demos, I'll, I'll get home and look at what I have done because I haven't looked at it all that much. And go, oh no, that's <laughs> that's what they thought. That's what it looked like. Other times I'm I'm pleasantly surprised. Well, let's hope for that. Yeah. <laughs> now here I'm tipping up the past a little bit so I get some of the background going through the, the blades of the uh, rushes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said, uh, altering from the photo that I wanted these rushes here to go up mm -hmm. over the line of the field mm -hmm. behind them, just to keep the composition flowing. So something takes the eye past that hard edge. Um, but I often will take the background color and dash it here mm -hmm. and there through what's overlaying it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that there's a sense of continuity. Um, I'll, sometimes when I'm doing a tree trunk, I will take the line of the background, say there's a horizon line going behind mm -hmm. the tree. Mm -hmm. I will take that line all the way across and then redo the, the tree trunk mm -hmm. so that there isn't up here. on one side of the tree, the horizon line is here, and on the other, it's, it's yeah. half an inch down or a quarter. You know, it's so easy to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the same idea here. I'll continue the line all the way across and make sure that it, it is continuous. Okay, I said I was going to get some darks up front. This is a Rembrandt. I can't tell you what the, the name or the color is. But it's a purple, a gray purple that I use mm -hmm. so much. It's neutral enough. It doesn't read purple. Yeah. But now what I'm starting to do is get a little um, more detail up front. So far, I've been working only back. And now I'm getting some light around the head of the swan. I tend to have my strokes go the direction of the object that they are depicting, mm -hmm. especially up front. So I'm having my strokes go the direction of the rushes. And because this is water, I might just carry the, the uh, color on below the, the uh, shoreline. At this stage, I do want to establish where that shore is. This is probably a black or something pretty close to black. I don't want the base of these rushes to be the same level as the swan. Um, and I don't want it to be a straight line. There's no need, because I mean, the rushes are certainly going in and out. Um, uh, as I look, maybe this is a, a deep blue. Deep purple blue. I was thinking it was more black, but um, that makes a huge difference. All of a sudden, there's um, detail up here, mm -hmm. and I always find I find it helpful to have to sort of establish where the shore is. Yeah, if people want to take photos, uh, feel free. I can step back. Um, I've lost the path a little bit. You know, asking me to step aside and happen. And I apparently I'm not in the way of the camera too much because nobody said, could you please <laughs> move? Or that's just the people who zoom. Right. <laughs> okay, let's get some green. This is a very light electric yellow green, probably a little too light, but just sort of a bank, and yeah. it's a little more upright, so the light is hitting it this way. And the, the path right now is too um, precise and pristine, so as I progress, I will start covering it a little bit, Ooh. kind of hiding it. Now, this is pretty intense color, so I am not mm -hmm. really pressing too hard. You know, this is where I would 
um, turn around and look in the mirror and just see, is that too intense? Do I like that right now? Is that gonna work? Um, I think I need more greens in the tops of the eucalypts at least. So they'll tie in some more with what's mm -hmm. going on in the foreground. And I have to decide if this is getting too big, the, the clump of eucalyptus trees. I don't like the uh, that maroon color up over the top. Um, that's that's one thing about what you know. I said I often use very hot colors, oranges, um, typically to do my sketch, my lay in. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is that will show through, and all of a sudden I've got orange lines way <laughs> off in the distance, mm -hmm. and those I have to cover up. I don't mind them so much up front. I kind of like the graphic feeling of seeing the sketch, the initial sketch still showing through, but I don't want orange. I don't want really hot colors way off in the distance because they, they break that illusion of distance. And that's what's happening on the tops of the eucalyptus is that I've got that maroon color. So I'm just cooling that down some. Mm -hmm. Okay, some of these trees are a little too intense. Mm -hmm. well, what they are is just the underpainting so far. And uh, there's a very straight line right there. I haven't decided what the color of the, the hills. That's a little too... Well, wow, here it reads green, here it reads gray, mm -hmm. but whichever it is, I don't particularly like it there. <laughs> so maybe I will continue with some of those um, lavender blues. Are you continuously using a fairly light touch so that you aren't um, losing um, a lot of your truth? Yes. Definitely. Do you ever use a, um, an eraser to pick up when you're not liking a color so, so that... Um... Uh, yeah. Um, I, what I'll do is take a brush, a dry brush, and clean out the area. And then this is a magic rub eraser. And so rubber, I'm assuming you, you asked. Yeah, um, I, it's a um, rubber eraser. And it'll go down through the pastel, if I'm using, now you have to be careful what paper you're using. You know, on these tough sanded papers, you can definitely use an eraser. Um, I said I remember the, the paper that's too delicate that's, uh, to use an eraser on. It's, it's cork and vegetable fiber. Uh, nope. <laughs> Not coming. So you do. You just have to make sure your paper is tough enough to handle an eraser. Otherwise, about the best you can do is use a dry brush and clean an area out. But often that's enough. This is going to come out more vibrant than this, I think. Mm -hmm. Again, two thirds, one third. I kind of like this to be twice as wide mm -hmm. as this, and then one, two, three mm -hmm. across there. And typically, think two thirds to one, one third warm, cool, or vice versa. Um, I might have a, the color of the. Uh, Oaks on the hillside be a little cooler up here, a little darker, a little warmer down here, especially down here where they're in um, shadow. Mm -hmm. And this would be something I would be again testing in the mirror to see if the values are holding up, um, kind of reading correctly. 
this might be a little too blue. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's something else I would test. But if I wanted to um, knock that down a little bit, I would just take this as a sort of a rose, a rose mauve tunnel. Just lightly drag that over so that the initial color is still showing through. But I'm getting some warmth to it. So it's not so cool. Mm. Now this, this is a green I have to be careful with because it's so saturated and so clean. It's it's a summer green. <laughs> and I can go overboard with it. I can put a little bit of it there. Ooh. Well, this is a deep summer photo, isn't it? Uh, a few weeks ago. So, yeah, late summer. It was after our very first storm. Oh, I did in the demo or in the description of this talk about um, this was going to be a water scene, too. So, I better do a little <laughs> work on the water. I think pastels are unnatural for water. I don't know if you can see, but I just took my thumb. I can establish the colors using what's up above and then just take it and drag down on my thumb and you get this very soft, watery reflection. And then I can come across with some horizontal strokes and all of a sudden it becomes a, a glassy or a, a horizontal surface rather than a vertical surface. So I love pastels for that. Looking good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. Again, um, I should really be in back. But there's no time for that. <laughs> so I'm not putting in all the detail of the swan right now. I'm, I'm just kind of getting some of the outlines in. You know, as I said before, if I want the focal point to be here, I can't do too much work on the swan. Mm -hmm. um, it might just have to be suggested. And that's the one nice thing about, you know, I said when I do people in my paintings, I'll just do little dots and maybe they'll have one color for their shirt and one color for their pants and a dot for their head. And we fill in the details yeah. right. because we're expecting to see people or we're expecting to see animals in the scene. So that already is, you know, maybe just a little dash of the um, of an orange for the, the beak. And there is some dark. And I would spend more time than this. But, you know, it's already giving the sense. I think it's up too high. Um, it's giving the sense of swan, hopefully. And it you is know, once the reflections on the water and I do some little dashes of, of the ripple behind the swan, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we humans fill in the details. Um, well, it moves the focal point away from the house. Mm -hmm. I know the it's so, you know, and, and that's that's when you do the thumb test, you know, close one eye and put your thumb over mm -hmm. the object you're not sure about. Is it better with or without, with or without? Yeah, maybe. No, I can't leave it out. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you're thinking of taking out the swan to keep the focal point higher? Well, I was talking earlier about the focal point. You know, the sweet spots are the intersection of thirds. So there'd be four of those, two here and about two uh, sort of here and here. So this would be the logical place to play that up. But I really like this one. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I have yeah. to, there'll be two, two focal points, dual focal points. Yeah. I hadn't heard before of the concept of having a focal point be an area of painting. Center of interest. Yeah, I, I've I read that. that a lot of places. And yeah, so.
Okay, the sun's coming this way. So I want to make sure that my the planes of the eucalyptus tree are getting more light uh, from this side. So I might go a little lighter, a little lighter. Um, uh, I'll get the same one. Curses. Oh, <laughs> yes. That's the trouble with all these little chunks. It's nice. It's so nice when you're you know, a watercolor and oil painter, and you just have a separate puddle, and you know what your colors are because you squeeze them out from the tube. Um, yeah, and that's way too much, right? Well, let's go for a cleaner green, more of a spring green. Once again, having to do a little mixing. I like this configuration mm -hmm. here, uh, more yeah. than the way I had it over yeah. here. Okay. This is still too, this is mm -hmm. mostly underpainting with some just a blue over it. So this will be altered quite a bit. Um, very dynamic right now. Good. When are, minutes. when are you gonna deal with that? Deal with what? <laughs> the, the, this yeah well when i'm done with all the rest no. oh. <laughs> here uh, you said till four right <laughs> <laughs> i missed something there <laughs> instead of ending at three we'll end at four <laughs> oh, okay. take your time uh, you know what i don't have to use the greens this is an ochre Ooh. Yeah. A nice. Uh, why not use some of that? I wouldn't want to use it on the outside edge because it's going to get confused with the hills in the background. Mm -hmm. But if I use it in the body of the tree, if I don't want you know a whole lot of attention to go here, I won't do a lot. I won't press too hard with whatever color I use. But I can just kind of feather. The color over yeah something else and it changes the, the temperature and it changes the value the light and dark well the dark is very good and i can always bring it back mm -hmm. okay i this this is um now kind of the stir it, it's just taking too much attention up close from a distance it might not be such a problem I want some of the grasses along this bank to go up over the path. We're kind of burying Ooh. the path a little bit now. I want a hand of shadow. Definitely more here. And a hand of shadow. Just just some delicate. Now here I'm tipping the pastel up a little. It's early to be doing detail work, but I want you to get a sense of how simple it is to get some um, dimension mm -hmm. so it doesn't look quite so flat. Just by doing some, some line work. And I don't typically either do a straight line. You know, I'll tend to do a broken line. Yes dots and dashes. And likewise, I would rarely just keep going straight across and kind of break that up. And it just looks so much more natural than a solid, chunky um, mm -hmm. line. Now here, I have a couple other barns, but I don't want them to um, detract from what's over here. So I'm using a, a slightly peachy. Yep. Uh, yeah, back what when we were kids, they would call that the flesh crayon. <laughs> and then maybe once again, you know, because pigment, uh, oh, I should say, one of the reasons I paint upright is this is a, a rough surface. If I were leaning it back, 
the pigment that, that, that's filtering that isn't actually adhering gets caught mm -hmm. all the way down on all that roughness. So periodically I'll do this mm -hmm. and you see a little cloud of mm -hmm. pastel come off. You the can ideal come down as your pastel. Uh... So yes. Um, the ideal pastel easel leans forward hmm. so that the excess hmm. falls off hmm. and never catches on the sanded paper. Hmm. It's like an odd angle to, to paint at, though. The hardest way to work is flat yeah. because all that excess it pigment that's not attaching is just piling up on your paper. Hmm. You'll turn it over or take it outside and just as clouds of pigment will come flying off. So... Hmm. Um, well, do you ever paint it so that it is uh, angled for you? Uh, yes, um, the main working wall in my studio is, it's actually stock fence, pig fencing or, or cattle fencing. It's, it's a wire grid mm -hmm. about this big and it leans away from the wall. Mm -hmm. And I use clothespins and um, my drawing boards are typically gator board, mm -hmm. sometimes foam core, but foam core just shreds the more tape you pull off of it. Mm -hmm. Gator board stays. Rigid and, intact. Yeah. So I'll use gator board and clothes pins, and I'll have eight, ten paintings going at once, oh pastels, and then I'll have two or three oils going at once, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. That way I never get to the point where I go, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I just move to a different painting. <laughs> and then always, you know, I'll, I'll know what to do in that one because it's been there for two weeks or, or two months or. So is there always a corollary photo like you're doing today with each of the pictures? Or a plein air painting. This this wasn't plein air, but I'll often have a plein air painting maybe this size. And, and yes, or a photo. Mm -hmm. I don't work from my imagination very well. Do you find that you end up spending a lot more time with the photos than you do in plein air? No, not really. Yeah, seasonally, of course. You know, I don't go out painting that much. And it depends on how many friends say, come on, we're going out painting. Because I don't go out by myself unless, you know, when I'm, I'm not sure you were here when I was saying, I took tri two trips to New Mexico this. Yes, I did. And, and it was easy to go out and paint by myself there. Mm -hmm. um, however, I don't typically go out all that much by myself unless they're just weather conditions that are so great. So it's always helpful when people say, come on, we're going out to paint. Now, there's a lot of the red in the paper showing through. Mm -hmm. So that at a certain point, I'm going to have to stop and really start covering that up. Um, I knew this was a pretty ambitious painting to um, do in two hours. So would you say you're halfway through? Three I quarters? would. Yeah, probably halfway through. Mm -hmm. The more detail, the more I do on the swan, the more attention it's going to get. So I have to leave it alone. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's gotten too long right now. Yeah. And that's only something I can see later on. Yeah. One I can really stand back from it. Um, yeah. What? Any other questions? But it has um, a lot of um, energy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Very even different. just the way it is. So it's um, gorgeous. Well, I love the way uh, our eyes move through it. I start with the swan myself in the lower left, and then up to the reach of those beautiful little buildings. And then up into those magnificent clouds. So it really creates a very interesting movement of the eye. Good. <laughs> Sometimes I think is, you know, I, I, and I did think about this, is it are there too many different things going on? Mm -hmm. And then as I get into it, if there are some harmony, like this for these lavender rose tones mm -hmm. that, that are all through the painting, like a little more blue this down. Mm -hmm. then I kind of think, no, maybe there isn't too much going on. But I do have to decide what to play up and what to play down mm -hmm. and how much detail. It's going to help when I start popping some sky holes into the eucalyptus. It's kind of solid. And that is the one 
problem can be of doing an underpainting, underpainting that's flat blocks of color is there's no air. Mm -hmm. You know, they are, as somebody said, like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. There's no real air or light going through it until I start punching in some sky holes. Um, well, what color would they be? I mean, would they be able to show the background? They would be, but the background color of value are too darker. Because if you use the same light color that's behind an object mm -hmm. in open, open areas, it'll look superimposed if you use that same oh. light color within the body of yeah. a tree. So th this this is maybe this color that I drag over. And I try to alter the shape. So I'll, my hand will be moving, mm -hmm. sort of twisting, pressing lighter and harder when I'm doing um, sky holes because it's so easy to make the same mark over and over yeah. and over. Mm -hmm. Even though you know, your pastel stick is kind of little by little breaking down. Well, here, here's the color I wanted, but it's it's a little tank. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. You know, sometimes there's just enough. What I like about our hills is that you can get a hard edge underneath a clump of, of oaks and bays and, and create this, you know, really uh, direct the viewer's eye. And so this up here, as I said earlier, it's kind of like the clouds. I don't have to spend a lot of time doing this meticulous rendering of trees on the hillside. All I have to do is kind of get that pattern, the flow, and get the values right. Now, right here, I'm going to want to break up this big chunk of uh, tree. And as I'm finding with my oils, um, the more layers I put on, the more interesting an area will get. You know, a similar value, but, but slightly different temperature or similar temperature, but slightly different value, overlaid and playing in, you know, much more interesting than just, okay, that's the color that this hillside is going to be, and that's the color that this, uh, this is going to be. And, uh, Now, I did say I was going to leave the tops a little lighter. What's this doing is, is pulling these hills away from the, the cool clouds. And this is about, yeah, yeah, about to the size I can't hold on to anymore. You almost need a tweezers. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes you have to, um, maybe watercolors too, mall sticks, mm -hmm. a stick with a, a, a ball or something on the end so that you can lean your, uh, without, you know, with pastels, it's more, it's much easier to smear. What did you call it? What kind of a stick? mall stick. M-A-H-L. Yes, it's a, yeah, it's a really flat spot. Mm -hmm. Some have a little ball, um, a leather ball on the end. Some have just a rubber tip, something that won't slide. So that you, you press you that lean against on the, the board, and then your hand can go over it like this. Okay, now this. Ooh. Now, if I were to do that, then I'd have to do some up here, too. Yeah, um, I don't see cattails here the way I grew up in Colorado. And we had cattails, and and this the place where I go to do paintings like this, they're, they're rushes of some other kind, and I would love to uh, uh, put some cattails in, but that might be a little too much. Now, as you can see, as I got closer to finished, and I'm not saying this is at that point yet, but I can, I can tip the pastel up, and this is where I would do some. 
Maybe I'll use a lighter color so it'll show a little more. Hit the pastel can do some dots and dashes of, uh, and maybe a darker color too. Well, that hardly showed at all. And it would help, you know, some can come out in front of the uh, clump of rushes. So there isn't such a delineation of like, this is land and this is water reflection. But then of course they have to do the opposite. And then maybe kneel down a little bit. Oh, this is gonna make a difference. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. To knock down that pink down there. <clears throat> and get rid of some of the orange over here. Although that's pretty close to the shadow of the swan. Yeah. Oh, and uh, I didn't, uh, what I was saying before, I forget to do in the reflection what I've done on the ground plate. So, all of a sudden, I've cooled this whole area down. Um, Kevin McPherson, um, I, I thought for years it was like, well, are reflections darker or lighter than what they were reflecting? And finally, reading Kevin McPherson's painting from the outside in or the inside out, um, his take is that light colors are darker in reflection and light, dark colors are lighter. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> that kind of reads right. Wait, say that again. Well, dark. light yeah. colors light are colors are darker okay. in their reflection, and dark colors are lighter in their hmm. reflection in the water. So just the opposite. Yeah, whatever they are. Yeah. Well, as long as they're not the same. You know, I even think if if they're the same and you've smeared them in pastels, then mm -hmm. that kind of is is doing exactly that same thing. It's knocking down the highlights and and lightening up the the darks. Mm -hmm. You know, the swan was really pulling a lot of attention, but it was exquisite. Now that you put the sky color in, it's not as, you know, saying, look at me. Good. And I haven't did a little work, you know, sort of smear the swan a little bit too. And that reflection is kind of going out a little bit. It, has to be, it would be cut in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Very good. Hmm. Now the eye jumps to the orange. Over here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's again what I would see by standing back or looking mm -hmm. in the mirror. It's like, okay, is that too hot? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I look at it now and it's like, oh yeah. You know, do the thumb test. And it's like the whole thing calms down without that. So or just drag a little bit of uh, all of the green over that. It's so nice to see how much fun you're having. Yes, <laughs> it's magic. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm. I'm assuming, you know, when you do your demos too. It, I. It, you know, it's fun to watch, to see all this mm -hmm. magic happen. Well, any other questions? Mm -hmm. I think we're about there. Would it be okay if we came up closer to it? Oh, please, yeah. yeah. Come up close, take photos, whatever. Yeah. And you can ask questions about you know, any specific little part. Or... How do you decide um, your framing? How do you decide if you're going to use a mat? How do you decide what color frame you're going to use? I rarely use mats anymore because so few other pastelists are using mats. Mm -hmm. And I've been part of plenary events for decades. I do fewer now than I ever have, but I used to do them around different regions, mostly in the West, Western United States. And over time, fewer and fewer pastelists were using gnats. Mm -hmm. And my work stood out not mm -hmm. to the good to, um, when I was using gnats. So now what I do, and I don't know, you know, for the folks here, there's a little plastic strip yeah. mm -hmm. about a quarter of an inch, eighth of an inch. Away from the, mm -hmm. 
attached to the glass that pushes the pastel away so it's not pressing against the glass. I know at least one pastelist who swears that that, that is how you frame with glass is have the pastel against the glass. Okay. And they, he says that that's what the English do. So and that it doesn't move maybe? So it doesn't move, yeah. Mm -hmm. But to me, I'm thinking it's so humid here. Yeah. That I would think some of the pastel would adhere. Um, well, I understood that, I can't think of what that word is for that bar, but my understanding was that it was so that um, when um, a little bit of um, dust settled, um, it has some place of rest. Yeah, yeah. It would be out of the out of the view. And that's you could do reverse bevels, mm -hmm. so that the bevel goes this way, mm -hmm. and the exactly the same thing happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the excess pastel filters down. So then, um, when I'm done with a painting, watch your step there. I'm pretty aggressive, and I down the back of the door mm -hmm. or the back of the door, and I blow on it. And this is outdoors, mm -hmm. so I'm not breathing it, and it's not filling up my studio. And my framers don't complain. Oh. So there's and no fixative. You don't put a fixative. I never use fixative. Yeah. Um, decades ago, when they outlawed fixative in California because of fluorocarbon way back then, mm -hmm. um, aerosol. I stopped using them. Yeah. And I never okay. used. And that's like again another reason why I use the aggressively yeah, yeah. sanded mm -hmm. papers because it really grabs the pigment. Holds on. Now this one um, is a new pastel in an old frame, and this is a, a linen liner with a bevel. Um, so I, I'm still reusing my old frames that have mats, um, but I don't typically use mats anymore. I I think it's the traditional way to frame paintings, and I like mats. Yeah, you know, as long because if it's the place for your eye to rest around. By your painting, it, it, yeah. I don't know. I like yeah. it. Yeah, it, it stops the outside world, kind yeah. of. Yeah, yeah. And, and and exactly as you said, yeah. I mean, look how great guys' um, mm -hmm. paintings look. Not traditional because yeah. they don't just continue on out. Right. It, it, as you said, stops yeah. the eye stops the and allows you to sort of rest in in the painting. Exactly. Sometimes I I found that I put a picture I did in a frame and it felt crowded. And then when I, I put um, a mat around it, it, it gave it more space. I like it. Yeah, a little breathing room. Yeah, I agree. It's just um, a number of my galleries do framing for their, their collectors. So I don't even choose how they're framed. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they often end up but when I do framing for myself or have framing done. Mm -hmm. I now use the frame space. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Do you paint for the gallery? Would they tell you what kind of style they want? Or? Not so much. But some one gallery says, we really like your oils, and that's what our collectors mm -hmm. want. Another gallery, I'm in a gallery down here in Morgan Hill, mm -hmm. um, Calibri Gallery. So that's pretty nearby. Mm -hmm. um, and they only want pastels. Mm -hmm. So in terms of medium, um, but uh, and, and the gallery, my my best gallery I'd say is in Mendocino, and they want the big oils with with metal leaf, copper, aluminum, mm -hmm. gold leaf, mm -hmm. because they have a big showroom right. ah, where they can yeah. have big canvases, yeah. and they're very popular. And I'm not going to argue with yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Did I just say the name of the one in Morgan Hill nearby? Colibri. Is that with a K or a T? The C. And it's on his website oh. also. I hope. <laughs> I, sure I take care of my own website mm -hmm. and I'm so <laughs> far behind. Well, this has been great. Yes, this, yes, this has been it. wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Yes. Well, you're welcome. I, I appreciate that you invited me and, and uh, always a good group when I come down here. Yeah. All right. What model are you doing? As I said, um, a lot of the tone of the paper showing through. So I'll make sure that's covered. I've hardly begun in here, but I don't want to do a whole